I heard about it from a friend of mine with whom I worked. I was working at the time at Pneumestic Laundries down in Rushcutters Bay, and this fellow had uh, a connection with another chap who was uh, an artist, and he used to write the old signs in windows of the shops and uh, whitewash, you know, sale and price of goods and everything. And he was doing a job in uh, Goodlands, which was a place in Pitt Street, 36 Pitt Street, on the ground floor. And up above was uh, the Workers' Art Club, or it was coming there. And working down below, he heard that there was going to be some activity up on top, and alongside Goodlands was a wine bar, uh, very convenient, and uh, the premises were up on the first floor. Well, he heard through association with people going in and out when he asked what was happening there, and. Uh, that it was going to open on a particular night. It was a Sunday night, and uh, he said to me, well, it'd be a good idea if we went along, because we were very interested in the work, mainly more or less in films, because we heard they were going to have film shows as well. So just by chance, I went along. Uh, I wasn't much impressed with the thing other than the fact because I had no idea of going into the theatre or anything like that. My ambitions were not in that direction. And uh, I thought, oh, that's good. Now, when are they going to put the films on? Sure enough, the next Sunday night, uh, they had their first film show. Well, it was rather an experience because it was an old German classic. I remember it very well. It was uh, one of Mono's films, The Last Laugh, with Emil Jannings. And they used to have regular screenings there. And uh, I was going to the show. Every Sunday night was when they had it. They also had a Saturday night, which was a dance. And that was the main uh, income for the theater, or rather the, uh, the arts club. The main income was from the Saturday night. It cost, I think, two shillings for the dance. And uh, on the Sunday night performances, it was a silver coin admission, because being an unlicensed hall, you couldn't charge to go in. So it was a donation at the door. Well, it was thought that at least sixpence, or if possible, a shilling, should be uh, the admittance charge. And uh, I went on there for uh, about the next 14, 18 months. And then uh, early in 1934, when I'd seen a couple of the uh, sketches or short plays which had been written by the members of the theatre, and one or two small uh, one actors, that uh, Sean O'Casey, I think, there was one of his plays, uh, I thought, oh, well, I'll join because Jerry Wells, who was the president of the theatre at the time, had made an appeal for members, and I thought, well, I'll go along and I'll join, which I did. And it so happened I went on the Tuesday, and it was the monthly general meeting, and uh, that was quite an experience. I started off in the Jewish Youth Theatre. At that time, there were a number of Jewish people in Sydney who were first and second generation from Russia, Poland, uh, various countries in Europe, Germany, uh, Austria. And uh, a lot of these people had a Yiddish culture, and they'd continued this Yiddish culture. And as a matter of fact, there was a Yiddish theatre in Sydney at one time. But the children, most of them, had a smattering of Yiddish. I certainly didn't, because my parents came from England. And uh, I didn't have any knowledge of Yiddish whatsoever, but a number of people did, uh, first generation, second generation, into this country. And uh, they wanted to sort of continue the, the sort of cultural links, like the uh, Mendel Mochitz Forum. Uh, there was uh, Shalom Alechem, uh, international writers of repute, of dramatists of great repute, especially Shalom Alechem and uh, various other uh, writers, Israel Zangwill, and uh, they thought that if they could establish a theatre which would present in English some of the uh, more meaningful plays that have meant so much to the Jewish people while they'd been in the uh, diaspora and the pale and the ghettos of Europe, that uh, it would be interesting. So I became interested in this, and um, we formed a, a group, and we put on quite a number of plays, and we had uh, quite a, a, a Jewish following in Sydney. And alongside of this was, of course, the 
the growing threat of fascism. The brutality of the Nazis towards the Jews was becoming more and more evident. Uh, the great um, uh, strife that they were to face hadn't arrived quite, but they were getting through through various channels that, you know, the Jews were being uh, shockingly treated. And being a Jew, of course, I was interested in this, of course, brought about an interest in politics. And uh, so when the uh, Jewish theatre sort of folded because of lack of premises at one particular time, and uh, there was a more broader movement against war and fascism, and I associated this with the uh, aims and uh, objectives of the new theatre, it was a natural thing for me to sort of go seeing I was getting more interested in, in politics and theatre, not only theatre. Yes, I uh, started off as a member of the uh, Young Communist League, and uh, my family were all of that persuasion. A long time before I was involved with the Youth Theatre of Action, uh, I used to go to the, uh, then the, the Workers' Art Club in the beginning. My family were very, very involved, particularly my mother, and she used to take me. And my father loved uh, uh, all sorts of theatre, particularly Gilbert and Sullivan. And so, yes, and through that, well, I, you know, became involved. And, of course, Little Diamond eventually became the secretary of New Theatre. And we had a theatre then in uh, Flinders Street, a beautiful theatre, not far from the Herald office. And uh, in the war years, I went in, worked in munitions, and I became quite ill, and I had a, quite a big operation. So that I then, uh, you know, they didn't want me to go back, the doctors didn't want me to go back to munitions. So I went and uh, Lil asked me to come and be an assistant secretary to her as she was secretary of New Theatre. Mostly I remember the period of the Depression which, in which I grew up and um, my father's um, concern and my mother's concern for that particular situation. Uh, it was something that I was aware of all of my childhood. And then I came to Sydney, my mother died, and um, uh, other female members of my family died. And my father was left with we three children, two brothers younger than myself, and I came to Sydney to live with a friend of the family's and spent the next years of my life living in a suburb of Sydney. I guess uh, you could say I had a stage mother. Um, she wasn't a pushy professional type of stage mother, but she did see her daughter as a, a performer. And uh, when I was a kid, Shirley Temple was sort of, uh, if she hadn't arrived on the scene, she was ready to bounce on the scene. And uh, my mother was very keen for me to learn dancing. And, um, took me to a studio in, uh, in Oxford Street, right at Taylor Square, the Kath Hanabry Studio of Theatrical Dancing, I think it was called. And uh, as it turned out, I think it was probably a very, very good thing that she did for me. I was extremely shy. Uh, unfortunately, it was the sort of studio that I had a classical ballet training, but also the theatrical side. So I was what we used to call, I did toe, tap and ballet. So that was on point and, and uh, learning about, you know, sort of toe dancing, as it was called in the studio. Tap dancing, of course, was, was very, very important. And, uh, and all sorts of other dancing. I mean, for instance, you know, if you ask me to get up and do a horn part, even now, I can do the basic horn pipe steps. I could do a basic Spanish style step. So I really came out of that uh, many years in that studio of having a very good overall um, uh, ability to turn on a different style of dancing. Well, of course, I didn't, of course, there was no way you'd know how valuable that was going to be in, in, in later years. And this was also from a very working class point of view. Uh, the studio, I'd say, mainly comprised of, of uh, working class kids. Uh, my family was very, very, very working class, very uh, non-political, 
I mean, it was many, I was, uh, had been married many years before I found out, for instance, that my grandfather had been in the 1890s shearing strike and had been quite a militant. Uh, it was about this time also I found out that one of my mother's brothers uh, was a member of the Left Book Club, um, which was raided um, by the police, people who had left-wing books and books were destroyed. Uh, he would have been a small L liberal, but coming out of a very working class background. I began writing very early. I think I was about eight when I first had anything published. This is when I was living in Rockhampton and um, was just a little story for a children's page. And I was very much encouraged by a cousin of mine who was older and ran the paper, so I was lucky to get it in, I suppose, and uh, I just liked writing. I began writing little poems and stories and so on, and uh, then when I was at school, I had my first taste of writing for theatre. In first year in high school, I adapted the Astonishing History of Troy Town. No, that was in second year, sorry. First year, I adapted um, The Pied Piper of Hamelin. And uh, this, I sometimes feel, was my very best go in the theatre because I was able to not only adapt it, but uh, make the costumes and uh, write myself a spanking good part as the chief rat. And I improved on Robert Browning by saying, uh, for myself, I wrote, alas, alas, our hapless brothers, hapless fathers, sisters, mothers, alas, uh, uh, our cousins, uncles, nephews, wives, alas, have lost our precious lives. Uh, but I've never had such a good go in the theatre since, doing all those roles, which is probably just as well. I remember while I was at Stuart School, this is in the mid-40s, uh, a play was brought to Katoomba, uh, Tomorrow the World, and uh, it was the new theatre production, which had started in 1945. And uh, I remember being very impressed by the tremendous sincerity and strength of this play. Uh, that was my first knowledge of new theatre. And then because of my father's interest in uh, coming to see good theatre in Sydney, musical and strong drama and so on, and being interested in new theatre because of the sort of left-wing um, aura that there was in the family, but uh, we often went to New Theatre when we, as a family, came to Sydney on business trips. After I'd been there a month or so, I suddenly discovered that I was more interested in the theatre, or as interested as I was in films. You couldn't make films, you couldn't act, and you were looking at films by then. It was, uh, films had dropped out a little bit, and the theatrical activity was right to the fore. So uh, I was asked to go in a couple of shows by Jerry Wells, who was the main producer at the time, and uh, also Vic Arnold, who also directed. He was the secretary of the theatre. And I went in a couple of small plays, and of course, once you've got the acting bug, well, it goes. Well, I was always handy with the tools and so on. And uh, my training had been technical. I'd gone to a tech college and uh, a high school and so on. and. Uh, Consequently, I could handle woodwork and uh, metalwork and so on. And ended up there, I was making the sets and uh, as well as acting in them. And uh, later on, when I had enough experience, I became a director as well. Often, I would possibly have gone in a play and Jerry would say, well, look, it's a very difficult one. You stage manage it. Uh, it's more important there than acting in the show. Right, oh, that's how it was. So there were a couple of others like that. Des Rowan was very similar to myself. Des uh, was an actor and he was handy with tools and so on. Charlie Kitchener, for instance, uh, was a very, very good uh, actor. He was a, an excellent painter. He was also a writer. We were all self-taught. This is the thing that uh, should be uh, remembered. We were self-taught. Uh, our own experiences 
what we had seen, what we felt we wanted to do. But at various times into the theatre came people who had uh, a bit of professional uh, skill. Montgomery Stewart, a well-known elocutionist and drama, uh, well, he was an actor, an old actor. He came along and he used to do, in the early days, he used to do uh, reci uh, recitals from the stage. Um, he used to do one called Mumbo Jumbo, King of the Jungle. And uh, he used to give us a few tips on voice and so on. My first experience is at the new was both an interest in directing, but primarily at that time I was interested in acting. And uh, I acted until the day I die, not the initial uh, production, but the later production of it. The production was going on all the time of that play. I played the part of Ernst there. And uh, during that period, there came to the theatre a play by, um, again, Clifford O'Day, it's called Wake and Sing, which dealt with a Jewish family in New York. And of course, being Jewish, I suppose, and uh, the fact that um, I might know something of Jewish life, they asked me to direct the Wake and Sing. And that was the first play that I directed at the theatre. It was a commercial success in America. And uh, I suppose you could say it was a commercial success in New York because the Yiddish theatre was a very flourishing theatre in New York. And uh, the uh, Jewish uh, community in New York were somewhat more idealistic than they are today. I should imagine there was a pretty strong socialist um, uh, community in those days and a play of this nature would have appealed to them immensely and it was quite a success in New York and we did it here and uh, I think it met with uh, quite a deal of success and that was my very very first play at the new theatre. Uh, from then on I was interested in the uh, committees, uh, particularly the production committee which I was a chairman of for a number of years. This committee of course was responsible for the plays that would go on. And uh, the break that I had from them was in 1942. I went into the army and the AIF, but uh, fortunately or otherwise, they decided they didn't want me on medical grounds. So this left me with the opportunity of concentrating all my activities at the new, which I did. But um, I think that I acted and directed in about in the 12 years, something like 32 plays. And uh, it was a tremendous experience because while uh, we weren't exactly trained uh, as professional actors, nevertheless, having this experience, gaining uh, stagecraft, the ability to stage a play, the ability to act the play, constantly working in the theatre is something that doesn't come to too many people because unfortunately the way things are in the theatre world, you might get one play in six months, you might get one play in a year, but to have this concentrated theatre doing 32 plays in a matter of 12 years was magnificent, both acting and directing. And um, although you put a tremendous amount into theatre, nevertheless, with the new theatre, I always got more out of it than I ever put into it. Well, when I was about uh, 19, I, and the war was on then, I got a job at Broadcasting Station 2SM, where I became the music, eventually became the music librarian. Um, this was because um, all the men had gone off to the war. The music librarian there was a man, and he'd gone off to in the Air Force or the Army. And uh, after about a year there, I found myself as the music librarian. We had uh, one of the staff there was a young lady called Pat Lavelle, and she was a member of New Theatre. Um, it was her um, influence, to some extent, getting me actually to, be, to come to the theatre and help her with costumes that she was preparing for, for herself to wear in a workshop plus the fact that I had already seen a number of plays at the theatre, two or three plays. The combination of those two things eventually got me into the theatre where I became a member. The first play that I remember seeing at the theatre was, um, I'm almost certain, 
it was the star turns red. If it wasn't, it was the second or third play that I saw. Around about that time, I, I went to the last a physician in spite of himself, which was um, part of the Molière season. Um, and I saw a marvellous comedy called Woman Bites Dog. Um, Six Men of Dorset. Well, you know, just those four plays alone would, were sufficient to, um, to make me aware that there was a different kind of theatre that was going to mean a lot more to me than the comedies and the musical comedies and the things that I'd already seen at the old Theatre Royal in Sydney. Because I worked at 2SM, I used to get tickets to go to these plays and I was really caught up in the whole idea of theatre. But I had no idea of its great potential um, for, um, for idea, you know, for, for the bringing ideas about life and society and politics until I went to the new theatre and, and that was really the most marvellous discovery for me. Well, I worked, uh, I was with the theatre in Melbourne for four years. Lil had left and I became the uh, secretary. And uh, so I, uh, I just got tired of it. I won't tell you exactly why I came, but I left Sid uh, Melbourne because of fam you know, family things and came up and lived in Sydney, but I made up my mind that was the end of my work with New Theatre. And uh, actually I worked on Tribune for a while, not as a, a, a writer, but, you know, office type work. And then uh, Paul Mortier, who was the, then the secretary of New Theatre, came and saw me and asked me to come and be an assistant to him. And I said, not on your way, I, I finished, you know, I mean, I love the theatre, but I've done my bit. And uh, so off he went, but he came, kept coming back. And eventually I uh, was talked into it. And then I don't know how much, I came to the theatre and worked in 1948. Uh, and I can't, uh, remember how long Paul was there but he was probably there for about 18 months and he then went and worked in the peace movement and uh, I um, became secretary. This began in Melbourne. I went to Melbourne in 1938 because my father was very ill there and I went to be with him and during the war which um, of course had broken out in 1939 um, I was asked to write a little play for the Red Cross and I wrote a little comedy, a one-act comedy called First Aid and uh, this was produced in Melbourne and um, there were three plays put on and mine was the only one written specially, the others were plays that they'd got from French's and it was quite a satisfaction because uh, um, it was given the first prize uh, by the judge. Um, I did continue an, involve an involvement with the theatre after the Red Cross play. I was some years there, a few years, was when I found myself involved with the Realist Writers in Melbourne, a small group that included people like uh, Frank Hardy and Eric Lambert and... Um, Max Brown, there weren't very many of us, but we used to re meet frequently and read each other's work. And I brought along a three-act play I'd written, and they read it all just around the table, and they liked it, and they said, you ought to offer this to New Theatre. And I didn't know very much about New Theatre at the time in Melbourne, so I offered it to them, and they liked it, and they said, yes, we'll uh, produce it. So that was my first contact with new theatre at all, which is in Melbourne. It was a very wonderful experience for me. I had a director that I got on with very well. Her name was Erica Rathgaber. She later came to Sydney. She lives here now. She did a beautiful production, and what I liked about it most was the fact that she involved me in it, and I was able to learn quite a bit. I found where I had weaknesses in the play. I found, for example, that I'd taken somebody off who, who uh, had to come back, but 
should have been allowed to come back on another side of the stage and I had to sort out a lot of technical problems and that production taught me a great deal. I came to the theatre, I came to the new theatre in a very roundabout way because after I'd gone through this long period of being a theatrical stage child dancer, I took up ice skating. I took up ice skating at a time when all my girlfriends were taking up ballroom dancing. But I, by this time, because Sonia Heaney had hit the screen, you see. So, but this was my choice this time. So I took up ice skating, so I lived at the Glaciarium rink, literally, and just loved it. And started to meet, socially met, met people. I was in my, I suppose I would have been uh, about 17 by this time, late 16 into 17. And so you, you form a new social, social group. And uh, I met uh, two people who didn't know each other, who talked to me about this theatre that they'd been to, that, and a, in particular a show, a show called God Bless the Governor, which was, uh, as I later found out, was written by Ted Willis, who later became Lord Ted Willis, um, an Englishman. Uh, they talked about the theatre. They had already seen, both of these blokes had already seen the show and were saying it was one of the funniest things they'd seen. Um, and in fact, uh, I went with one of them to see God Bless the Governor. And of course, I, it was just hilarious. It was, a, it was an old style melodrama where you hiss the, hiss the heroine, the, the hero. But it was about, uh, it wasn't like, for instance, the music hall that, that we would have seen over at, at Neutral Bay. It had a message because the, he, the, the hero and the heroine were working class, uh, poor country, uh, English country. Um, types and the and the villain was uh, the landlord uh, who who wanted to I can't remember the plot but you know he was he was the villain so there was this class situation but I mean I wasn't conscious of the class situation just that it was a bloody funny show and um, and then the other fellow asked me what I like to see and I said oh, well I've already seen it but I'll I'll go along with you so I went along for a second time and in fact I ended up then organising a small group of other friends to come and see it because it was like discovering something really quite, I mean, the, I mean, the fact that it was humorous, I'm sure, and light for me was very important. I'd been to the Minerva Theatre to see a couple of straight shows with, with people and it uh, wasn't terribly, uh, you know, it was interesting to go to. Prior to that, I'd seen probably nearly every Tivoli show with my mother. We used to go Saturday afternoon, every change of program. So I'd seen a lot of variety, a lot of review type material. Uh, had seen a little bit of straight shows uh, at the Minerva, had seen Gladys Moncrief in, in uh, Mad of the Mountain. But here, I'm in this small, dingy little theatre. We, I dressed up to go, but I could see not everybody dressed up to go. I mean, there were all sorts of people there. But I remember the thing coming out of seeing it and saying, not only that I thought it was funny, but the people on this stage didn't talk, and I'm actually quoting what I said, didn't talk like they all came out of the same sausage machine. And that was the, cl the, that was the clearest way I could express this place was different. I think because they were people, you know, not cardboard type of cutouts. Even though I love Betty Grable movies and all of that, as you know, but there was something. So the three of us, the three girls that I've just mentioned, Mari and myself and, and this other lass, we decided that, uh, we found out that uh, they might like to have people join to help in this theatre because I think somebody else had found out that, that they were short of, always short of people to help out. And we were typists, we were office workers. So we went up one lunch hour to this, to this place and Pat Flower was, uh, I think she was the assistant secretary at the time, but she was the person who greeted us at the counter. And I remember very clearly, we walked up, up to the counter, up two flights of stairs into the counter. And we said, we would like to join the theatre but we don't want to act. We made that quite clear. We don't want to act, but uh, we can type, we can... Well, Pat Flower, we almost had to pick her off the floor because for three females to walk into any theatre, even now, and say, but we don't want to act, and mean it, was just incredible. So, of course, you know, she couldn't sign us up quickly enough and we paid whatever the very tiny fee was. It was only 20 cents, 20... Two shillings, sorry, two shillings. You couldn't even buy the, the fluid, the eraser fluid that was like you used nail polish in those days because it was still soon after the war when it was still hard to get all sorts of things. So that was my first actual technical job for New Theatre, was typing scripts. And then from then on, I was asked to go on a little subcommittee, etc. And from there, that's the way it, it all started. It all started just from, 
<laughs> from the Blackerian skating rink. Well, uh, that's a funny story. I think you'll probably enjoy it. The, this was in Melbourne uh, during the war years uh, after I went to work at the theatre. And uh, Hilda Essen, who was Louis Essen's wife, was the president of the theatre. And Hilda was doing a play. It was... Uh, I've forgotten. Uh, a Russian play, I think, I'm sure. And there was a little boy <coughs> needed in it. And uh, I suppose for my age now, I'm not what you call fat. Uh, but I was pretty skinny then, and I'd always wore my hair eaten cropped for years and years, long before a lot of other people. And um, Hilda was a wonderful woman, and she... Uh, we used to argue, but we loved each other, and she used to, she came to me and she said, Miriam, I can't find a little boy. I said, well, we've tried, Hilda. She said, yes, I know. She said, well, you'll have to do it. I said, oh, come off it. I said, you know how terrible I am. Oh, she said, no, you'll be lovely. You'll be really lovely. She said, you'll look good in the uh, costume, you know, which was a bulky uh, coat of lined with fur and all this sort of thing and a hat that stood up and the you know the things came down over the ears and everything i said oh hilda you know that i can't act she said well i think you can and she said you know we'll work at it and it's only a small part so eventually i gave in and um so the play opened and um the thing is that uh, I was on for the first weekend, and I think I might have done... See, we used to play right through in Melbourne, uh, for, uh, except Sunday, and uh, for two weeks. And I think we'd gone about three or four performances. And Hilda said, um, well, look, it'll be all right, Miriam. We've got somebody else to do it. We have a little boy that'll do it. I said, oh, that's very, very good. And so the little boy went in. And then eventually Hilda came up to me and she said, you know, we often argue and fight. She said, but I must admit that I was wrong and you were right. You really can't act. And that was my acting career, Finney. <laughs> Uh, the first, first, because though, I suppose because of going in the first place to do some work with costumes, I found myself looking around to see where I could help. Um, and I remember the first positive thing I did was Keith Gow, who with whom I subsequently worked in the film unit, was doing a workshop of uh, Chekhov's The Bear. And uh, it was a rehearsal, and he was putting the He'd put the set up, which he'd designed, and he was arranging the furniture. And he just turned around and, and looked at me and said, do you think you could do something about those curtains? And I said, yes, of course I can. And I went and got scissors and needle and cotton, and I arranged the curtains in the way I thought they should look. And he said, yes, that's fine, that's fine. That was actually the first thing that I can remember doing on the stage in the theatre. But then after that, because I got involved in workshop and um, a willingness to, uh, an availability, I suppose, and a willingness to be involved quickly found me work because, and also the fact that I was in the music library and I had access to records, I found that I was doing music um, for plays. We seemed to use a lot of music in those days. So those were the things that really, uh, that I remember yeah. first doing. Uh, and I, th I think my, um, I could always sew, and there always, there has always been um, a shortage of people to do work on costumes. Elsie Dane had, had been their marvellous costume lady for many years, and she was phasing herself out. And uh, she helped me do, I think, wardrobe for uh, Juno and the Paycock. And then I began to familiarise myself with the very meagre wardrobe we had at the time. And I started to look for things to build it up. I think it was where I discovered that uh, I liked to be part of a group. Um, and so long as what I did had some effect 
and what finally went on the stage, uh, I didn't really mind what it was. I wasn't interested in acting. There seemed to be plenty of good actors around. And, um, but I was very interested in helping um, the people who were acting and the people who were directing to, um, to do what they wanted to do. And I met Cedric Flower and uh, uh, Rod Shaw and people who were designing there and saw the costume designs. And often we didn't have a designer, so you had to uh, find out what was required yourself. And I found that very exciting. I really, I really loved it. I think I made a rather rapid jump, though, from being what might perhaps kindly be called a lyric playwright, uh, I'm sorry, a, a lyric poet to a, a radical playwright. Some people have rather wondered at this because I think my poems were, uh, the best of them anyway, fairly lyrical. And a lot of them were very subjective about the way I felt as a teenager and as a young adolescent. And when I came to the theatre, I really welcomed it because it taught me a great deal about objectivity. Uh, I've, it helped me to find myself and be less shy than I'd been before. And because with the play, we're dealing all the time with other characters. And although you put a bit of yourself into every character you write, you are also projecting yourself into other characters. So I found that this was a, a very good remedial exercise as well as an interesting one in an art form, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was at the end of 1951 that, uh, by chance, a very uh, close friend of ours who had lived next door to us in Katoomba was actually staying at the small boarding house that my mother and father had set up in Ashfield. And he had become involved in new theatre in uh, a children's play called The Travelling Musicians, which was being written by Ross, uh, by he himself in music, that was Ross Thomas, and by uh, Peter Francis, who was the, uh, also the director and also one of the people who played in this children's play. And they were looking for a set designer, and I'd never done work like this, although I had had some uh, very much untrained art experience. I would have been 20 at that time. And... Um, as a result, uh, uh, I was asked would I come in and start to work on this setting. Now, I'd always had a theatrical bug uh, from this sort of background of seeing theatre, uh, one of those rare things I would imagine for a, a boy from the Blue Mountains, uh, rare also, I should imagine, for most kids around the city. But uh, there I was uh, suddenly in a position where I could do something in a theatre. So um, with uh, Ross's interest in new theatre, and I knew that uh, new theatre was quite an exciting theatre with the same sort of ideas that I generally believed in. And so I came to work in it, and I did my first sketches and actually making of the set for the children's play, The Travelling Musicians. I suppose for the first year, I didn't understand most of the conversations I heard around me at new theatre. I didn't understand the political conversations, and there were many. And I didn't understand the theatrical conversations because it was all... Con I mean, I kept hearing Stanislavski being mentioned. And, um, and I, as a, I mean, I was really very shy. I was totally out of my depth conversationally. I could gossip when I got to know some of the people, you know, it, I, I could talk about people. I was a dreadful gossip when I was a kid, but looking back, I think it's because it was the safe ground I was uh, on in that period. One very short story, I'll try to make it short about Stanislavski. Yeah, I heard this name, Stanislavski, and I got to be able to say it even. And um, at this period, there was a, a family living next door to, to me at Canterbury, the Nicol, Nicholas family. And the, the son of the Nicholas family was about eight or nine years older than me. And he was interested in acting and had a very fine tenor voice. And so he joined up with a little amateur group. And in fact, they had asked me at one stage to do a walk-on for them. Uh, and so I knew he was into theatre. He knew I'd joined this left-wing theatre because he was very, very right-wing. Lovely person, but right-wing, I started to realise later there was a difference. So he... I remember coming home very excited one night and, I, and, and meeting Jack and saying, guess who's a member of New Theatre, Jack? And he said, I don't know. I said, Stanislavski. And he was very polite. And he said, ah... Oh, I don't think so, Mary. And I said, yes, he is. He's a member of New Theatre. He said, look, Stanislavski, if he's not dead, he, he must be... He lives in Russia, Mary. I said, oh, are you sure? Mm. 
Well, of course, what had happened was I had met Stanislav Polonsky, who was a very prominent member of the New Theatre and a very fine actor. And they, were, they used to call him Stanislav. And I used to hear Stanislav. So, so that, was, that was me then. <laughs> right, I tell this to students now because I think, you know, I mean, I like to think that it's an indication of how far you can, you can go after you leave school through influences and the people you meet and what have you. So that was, that was the story of Stanislavski. I had begun to have uh, political feelings it, during the war, I think. I felt that the war was such a dreadful business and seemed completely unnecessary to me, although I had realised that finally Hitler had to be stopped. I felt he could have been stopped earlier. Uh, if, it seemed to me that the uh, reason he wasn't stopped earlier was that people were rather hoping that um, Hitler might uh, go east before going west, so they uh, delayed their uh, action. And I thought the war was a frightful waste and a dreadful thing. And uh, when I joined the Realist Writers Group, I found there were people there who uh, agreed with um, my feelings. And in fact, my feelings just agreed with the, uh, the feelings I found in new theatre. So it wasn't uh, an unnatural thing at all. At the time, the theatre seemed to be concerned about um, peace, uh, about um, employment for people, um, about basic uh, needs, not, not only in, in um, Australia, but throughout the world. And the plays that they were doing seemed to me to be drawing attention to a whole way of life that um, so to people who'd gone to the war to fight for, against Hitler, th these things seemed to be slipping away. And I suppose my, my social conscience was really um, emerging strongly. And everything we did in the theatre then seemed to be positive and affirmative about um, the ways that one could do something to change the world. You, you know, you felt that you, you, were, you belonged to an organisation that really was concerned and um, that through theatre and through touching people's hearts and minds, you could send them out after seeing a performance with a feeling that they could do something and not just say, oh, well, we had nice, nice entertainment and, you know, that was lovely, but that we have to do something to make the world a better place. I left Australia in 1948. My, this play I was speaking about called Here Under Heaven was produced in Melbourne New Theatre in May 1948, May to June, and I went overseas imme almost immediately afterwards. Uh, I went on the uh, Strathaird on the long trip across the sea and uh, uh, arrived in London uh, in um, 1948. And I took this play uh, immediately to a theatre called Unity, which is a sort of counterpart of, uh, of new theatre. And I was rather disappointed that they didn't immediately want to do my play. They uh, didn't like the fact that it was set in Australia. They said nobody would be interested in Australia. Another thing, uh, it had, my play had in it reference to Aborigines, and they said, couldn't you make them Negroes and set your play in uh, America? And I said, no, I couldn't. And so unfortunately for me, that play was never produced on the stage in London. Strangers in the Land was being performed in, at uh, Unity when a group of people from the USSR came. One of the first cultural groups came to London and they saw it and they liked it and they uh, took back a copy and I thought I'd never hear any more. But um, some months later, I received an invitation to go to Moscow. They said they were going to perform it and they wanted to discuss it with me. So I uh, went there and I had uh, discussions with people and then I had a, a very extensive trip for six weeks throughout a good deal of the USSR and after that other countries like um, 
Germany and uh, Czechoslovakia and Hungary and uh, later China and then India uh, produced that play and Strange and um, also Here Under Heaven. I didn't feel when I was uh, travelling that I was behind any sort of curtain, iron curtain or any sort of curtain. I was certainly treated as a, a VIP and I know and as most people with any sort of reality know that you get completely uh, different treatment. Uh, your conditions are very much different from those of the ordinary people in the best hotels all the time and, and shown around and shown everything. Uh, I was uh, aware of this, but I didn't, um, I wasn't aware of any um, major restrictions as far as the other people were concerned. I thought their conditions in 1953 as it was uh, were, didn't compare favourably with those I was used to in London. When I returned to Australia, I was surprised to find that the fact that I had made this trip was known everywhere and I was met at a, every Australian port by people who were obviously security people and they wanted to see my passport, which an odd-looking document with um, no visas uh, appearing in it to these countries and yet I'd obviously gone from Austria to somewhere or other. And this was because the passport in those days, the Australian passport, had a, a, a document in the back of it saying not valid for and about 20 countries followed and they include all the East European countries. So um, my passport was a strange looking document. I'd obviously left Austria but to go where? <laughs> but nobody took my passport but they looked at it with great interest. And, uh, when I arrived in Sydney, they uh, wanted to uh, read all my notebooks, but mm, I think my handwriting rather uh, foxed them, so they <laughs> gave it away and gave me back my notebooks. I had um, Margaret Bar when she first came to Australia. Uh, she sailed across from New Zealand on a, on a sailboat and uh, somehow came to the new theatre in Castlereagh Street. She was probably the first bohemian that I, have, I ever really met and um, uh, wore sandals and was always tanned and I mean she was an individual lady, much of course younger in those days and she asked would, would we like her to do some classes that she'd studied with Martha Graham. Who's Martha Graham people were saying, you know, I mean was, she was just so way ahead of her time for us. She took, she, she started some, some dance uh, classes she would come into the dirty Castle Ray Street New Theatre and the space that was allocated for classes. She would come in before class and scrub the floor. This is something she continued doing in her own studios. I mean, when she was probably making enough money to employ her clients, she would get down and scrub her own floors. If you worked for Margaret Barr in class, you always had a clean floor and she made sure from her own effort. But the other thing about Margaret that I remember very clearly in, in that very first stage she was ahead of her time for us. We were into the socialist realism, you know, and everything had to be, well, if it was there, it was there and you touched it. She'd get us into doing these strange exercises and you'd hear her say, the flora does not exist. And we'd say, what? Oh, you know. And of course, some of us didn't bother, didn't bother going. I mean, you know, the flora does not exist. I mean, God, the flora is there, it exists. But no, the flora does, I can't do a very good imitation of Margaret, she's so special. But I just got the habit of going to see Ma every show she did. And so, I mean, half the time I couldn't understand what she was on about. But there was something about her that drew me to her. The shows, I, the challenge, I guess, of trying to work out, never reading the program first because you couldn't understand the program anyway, uh, and, and uh, then working out later what your interpretation was and talking to her. She always was extremely friendly to me. Then later, we were doing shows at the theatre like Sandhog down at the Wharfies, and Sandhog needed some dance drama. And I remember saying, Margaret Barr's the one. Get Margaret Barr to do it. She said, yes, she would, and I approached her on behalf of the theatre. She said, yes, she would. She'd do it if I would act as her assistant so that when she was busy with her work and her classes, then she'd know that, that I could carry on and make sure that her work was carried out. So that was, I think, the first show we worked on together for the new theatre. But that was followed by at least two, three others. 
uh, and always we worked together. I did her class, I mean I was 30 I think when I actually went to her classes every Monday night. Nearly killed me but I mean by this time I certainly, I mean I was well and truly hooked on Margaret but I couldn't transfer into her work because it wasn't, wasn't for me. But we've had this tremendous association. I consider that she's a genius. Uh, I think she's an extremely courageous woman. I mean, she had that ideal and she followed it and everything that she's done has had some social content to it. Never has she, um, because her work might not have been popular, has she compromised her principles and her ideals. I think she is. I've just been so privileged to work with her. Peter Francis was, um, uh, was sort of in the process of having other interests. And so when, when I talked about him in the early days, I mean, he was seen as the choreographer. I sort of stepped into his shoes and then was seen as the person, go to Mari for dancers. I mean, I had tap dancing classes in the theatre, which weren't very extensive, but, you know, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, so, and, and that role has sort of continued right through the years, not as the sole choreographer, but, um, you know, I've done many shows. Um, and it's just... And I couldn't have done them if I hadn't had this great variety in my training. Uh, I, I consider myself very old-fashioned now. I can do things like when Frank Barnes did uh, on the Wallaby last year. I mean, that was... Um, uh, I staged one of the big numbers in that, and it was set in the Depression. So what I do is, is bring the period that I came through in the style of dancing. I can do that. I can reproduce that. After sort of doing a few straight plays, um, and I suppose alongside of that, I was also uh, accepting some responsibility to act as assistant to directors. Um, now, assistant to the directors is, I suppose, in film terms, like a gopher, you know? Uh, but being an assistant director is a different thing. So I gravitated from secretary to the production, to assistant director, to assistant, assistant to the director, to assistant director. And uh, so I worked with some very, very good people, learned a lot, learned a lot. Didn't always know what I was learning, but now looking back, I know that I learned a great deal. And then eventually comes the time when somebody says, well, how about, you know, now's the time. You've been assistant director to, you know, Eddie Allison, John Armstrong, Keith Gow. Well, now, you know, how about you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know that I can. The first production that I uh, accepted was a Ballad of Angels Alley. And John, my husband, whom I'd, I'd know, I had assisted, he acted as, as the assistant to me. And, um, but did it in a very good way. I mean, he really was letting me sort of carry it, but he was there to, to help. But that, ha that was a musical side, had choreography, which I did myself, and the acting, I had some very good people in it, which was a great help to a new director. So that was my first experience, but of course what I learned then was how much I didn't know. Of course I learned that. I mean, oh, you know, help <laughs> was going up all the time. But nevertheless, I did it. And then the first straight, I did a workshop called The Death of Bessie Smith by Edward Albee. And then it was decided to make, make a, have a major production which used that and another play. So then my workshop became a major production. That was very successful. Then the biggest, the biggest straight play I did was uh, Lorraine Hansberry's um, in Sydney Bruce Stein's window, which was a tremendous success. And by this time, I mean, I, it was, I knew then that I, that I did have some, some talent for directing. If you could contribute anything in the theatre, you were accepted for what you could contribute. And it allowed the individual to develop fully. You got some form, feeling of fulfilment from the theatre because of its very nature because of its cooperative nature, because of its ideological background, let's put it that way. The theatre, what we were striving to do, our endeavours was bigger than the individual, bigger than the ego, let's put it that way. And this is where uh, the major satisfactions came from the theatre as far as people in the theatre were concerned. And this made us different from any other theatre in Sydney. And I suppose this, this attitude towards theatre uh, and uh, the way that we directed down there, the way that we acted, uh, has become regarded in Sydney as a certain style because I remember on many, many occasions people came down to the theatre had no idea of what the theatre was about but said, well, we've been recommended by such and such, recommended by such that you can get a good training down the new theatre. It was 
understood in those days that if you wanted to get a training in theatre, come to the new theatre. And I think that speaks for itself. I can't emphasise enough the encouragement that I was given to express myself by so many people that I met in new theatre. If I'd just been uh, taken at face value or just what I appeared to have, and that was a talent for typing, um, a talent for tap dancing, and left there, well, that's, I mean, I would not be a member anymore. Um, the kindnesses that were shown me by people taking an interest in me, um, I, I feel very guilty myself now when, when I don't have time to do the same thing with people that are around me. I'm ve always very cognizant of that fact. I mean, that, that I could have, I don't know what would have happened in my life if I hadn't had that, if I hadn't had the personal approaches made to me. It was uh, an affirmation of, of my um, political commitment to socialism. It, it was um, a part of me that um, just went on from there, that brought me into contact with people who felt the same way as I did, with the people with whom I eventually worked in the film unit, with people, dozens and dozens of people in my life that I regard as friends that I don't see for years and years, uh, all seem to me to have come from my affiliation with New Theatre. Um, I can't ima have imagined my life, what it would have been like without this base of, um, of uh, politics and also of uh, creativity. Because I think in everybody there is, uh, there is a, a, a need uh, to be creative. I think it's, it's in the way you do everything, uh, in your own house, in where you work. If you don't have a creative attitude to it, um, it, it doesn't, it's no good trying to do it. It doesn't work, you get tired or bored. If you can bring that to whatever you're doing, it becomes something that you can cope with. But you need this other um, world, or at least I did. And I found it all in new theatre. I found this constant demand uh, to learn to express myself. When I first went there, I would listen to everybody else. And um, workshops, for example, you'd go to a workshop and there would be discussion, always discussion. Everything was discussed. And if you just couldn't sit there and let all your thoughts go whirling around in you, eventually, in, even though you might have expressed yourself very badly, you were on your feet trying to say something. And if it didn't come out the way you wanted it the first time, well, the next time you were determined that it would come out so that people really knew what you were talking about. And if it meant um, that occasionally uh, uh, tempers flared or ideas clashed uh, and uh, there was uh, generated um, uh, feelings of uh, what one might call um, if people get anxious now about a little dissension. A little dissension is good. I mean, uh, it gets people uh, stimulated to, uh, to express what they feel and to think clearly about whether they might have been right or wrong. And so for the, all this, uh, I would say I found it at New Theatre. And uh, I, I just wonder what my life might have been like if, if I'd never found New Theatre. Certainly when I found New Theatre, I knew I'd found the place where I wanted to be.